All right, everybody, welcome to New Life Alliance Church. Didn't mean to scare you like that. <laughs> We're grateful that you've come to worship with us to the, on this very day. Would you please stand with us?
blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Hallelujah, the lion and the lamb. Jesus, our healer. Jesus, our comforter. Jesus, our peace. Father, in this place, we invite your Holy Spirit to do a work within us. Father, you have drawn us here this day, this moment in this time. And Father, we would pray that you might work within our hearts and within our minds. Would you reveal yourself to us very clearly, very openly and very strongly. Father, for those that have come crawling in, they're hurting, they're lost, they're confused. Father, might you be their peace, might you be their comfort, might you be their healer, might you bring them everything that they need to endure. Father, there are those that come in skipping and praising and glorifying you and celebrating. Father, would you inhabit the praises of your people. Father, this day, here we are in the midst of your presence. We honor you this moment in this time do your work within us as we humble ourselves before you and declare that indeed you are our God we come before you in the name that is above all names your son our savior the Christ Jesus in his name amen you may be seated in his presence this morning, we have in the doghouse, we have Alexis King. Alexis King, come on up here, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You want to? Yeah, I'll get you. How, how can we pray for you? You can come up too, sweetie. Come on, come on. Well, I know one way we can pray for you. There might be two ways we can pray for you. Where's Blue? He said, oh, he's in the back hiding somewhere, eating some more pizza. He's eating pizza. Can't stop the boy from eating pizza. Boys will be boys. How can we pray for you, dear? Um, just for my mental health. For your mental health? Yes, and to get a better job. And to get a better job? Because I want to be off on Sundays. I'm tired of rushing away. Uh, you want to be off on Sundays. So, like, you show up here early, right? Put in your time, and then you rush off to work. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you're tired of that. Yeah. yeah, amen. You know what? Many people wouldn't even do what you're doing. It's not right. They would just sleep right on through till it's time to go to work. Thank you. The Lord is honored that you do what it is you do. So let's pray for you. Father in heaven, I just want to come before you and uphold my dear sister. Father, as you have already begun a good work within her life, Father, I pray that you would continue the good works. And, Father, that as you uphold her, Father, physically, I pray that you uphold her mentally as well, Father. Keep her without anxiety. Keep her without stress, Father. Father, even as she looks for an, a, a new employment and new work, Father, I pray that you would carve a path. Make the way easy, Father, that she would see clearly that which you're doing in her life. Father, I praise her and praise your name for the way in which she continues to serve you, seek you, and follow hard after you. Father, it would be easy to stay home and be lazy and sleep until it's time to go to work. But Father, Father, and her spirit, and her heart, and her mind, Father, she feels it is necessary to be in the house of the Lord, to praise God, and to be with his people. And Father, I thank you for her example. Father, I thank you that she is dedicated and committed to you. I pray your blessing upon her. Father, I pray your blessing upon her children as well. Father, may your favor shine brightly through her life, and may her life be a living testimony of what God can do in the midst of someone's life. With all honor and praise, come before you in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. You know, I love you. Yeah. Love you too, baby. God bless you. Does 
anybody have anything? We've had so much going on, and it kind of like everything blew up like on trunk or treat, and now we're going to prepare for Thanksgiving dinner. Right? That's only a few weeks away, right? Mm-hmm. And we're going to prepare for that. And so one of the things we want to do is we want to have a sign-up sheet so that if you're going to come, and you're all welcome to come, please come, right? We'll cook some turkeys and have some ham and stuff, and then you bring some fixings. So instead of everybody bringing a pumpkin pie, we just have a sign-up sheet. This is, I'll bring some beans, I'll bring a pumpkin pie, I'll bring a, right? I'll bring the mashed potato, whatever it might be, so that we know, right, not everybody's going to bring a pumpkin pie, right? Not that I mind too many pumpkin pies, but, you know, you kind of know what I'm saying. So we anticipate uh, several people to show up, and uh, we're anticipating that you're all welcome to come. And uh, if you like, please invite a neighbor or a friend or anybody to come and share Thanksgiving. Uh, we end up doing Thanksgiving usually like at the church and at a family right time. So two in the afternoon on Thanksgiving, we'll be doing Thanksgiving dinner here at the church. Okay? We're all good? Yep. Or you'll hear that a few more times. And at some point, I'm sure there'll even be a sign-up sheet. But in the meantime, check this out.
Well, they keep coming in. Everybody's looking for places to park. We, got, we do have a few more places. People walking in off the street. We are busy, 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 busy. They just keep coming. Thanking God for this. This is what it's all about. You were... such a big turnout even the cops showed up <laughs> this minister to them too i see you guys are already standing
Lord, to build our lives upon you, Lord, and to trust you with our heart and our soul and give you all that we are, Lord, that you might take us and use us for your honor and your glory. Father God, we give you all we are. We promise you all that we have. Fill our hearts, Lord. Move through us. build our lives on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's prepare for communion. Who has believed our message? Remain standing if you are. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people would hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely, he took our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to their own way. And the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation even protested? He was cut off from the land of the living, and for the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life an offering of sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands." And as after he has suffered, he will see the light of day, and he will be satisfied by his knowledge. By my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, God will divide a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. In this place today, Father, we humbly admit we are transgressors. We have fallen short of the mark that you have laid out before us. Father, I would pray the blood of Christ. I would pray the blood of the suffering lamb. I would pray, Father, For that man, that Messiah, that Emmanuel that Isaiah prophesied about concerning our iniquities and our pain and our hurt, that you would bring healing to us in his name, that you would cover us and cleanse us. Father, as we prepare even for communion, 
I pray that as we take you in, we would honor you and worship you from the inside out. You would cleanse and make us whole in the name of your son. You may be seated in his presence. I'd ask those that are going to serve communion with us to come forward. I know I mess everything up all the time, but you are out of order, sir. But the reality is the spirit of the Lord is strong and strong in worship. We need to honor Jesus and honor him and worship him. And oftentimes what ends up happening, you stay standing, gentlemen. What ends up happening is that I end up coming up and preaching and every eye is focused on me. I don't want eyes focused on me. I want you focused on Christ. I want you focused on Jesus and worship ushers that in where we praise him and we honor him and we glorify him. And at this communion table, we remember him and what he has done for us. The story is fairly familiar. He was with his disciples. He had taken bread, he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, take this and eat this, for this is my body, which is broken for you. All those that believe, may you partake with us. Gentlemen, come forward, please. Thank you. Come on. Perfect. Thank you. Come on. May distribute.
body of Christ broken and given for you as a ransom. Let us take together. similar manner he had taken the cup he gave thanks he gave it to them saying take this and drink this for this is a cup of my blood spilled out and shed for the forgiveness of your sins signifying and sealing an everlasting covenant between God and man Gentlemen, if you would please. Stop playing. You're going to stop playing. We're all going to sing, Turn Your Eyes. Take us to eat. 
pray that you would wash us clean from the inside out. May our light shine brightly for you. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done and the way that you cleanse us. We come before you with thanksgiving and praise. Let us partake together. Father, as we have consumed, we gather and partake together in remembrance of what you have done for us. Have your way. In the name of your Son, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is a kingdom that exists outside of the physical realm. It is not built on earthly power and its nature is not worldly. It is a kingdom within mankind, set up in their hearts and souls. Its riches are spiritual, its power supernatural, and its glory eternal. It does not need weapons of this world or armies of men to maintain or advance its borders. Its object and design are not physical. This is a kingdom not of this world. It is invisible. Who soaked the scripture this week? Some of us? All right. Excellent. 1 Corinthians 12. The entire chapter. Which I don't know how many verses that is, but we'll get through it. 30 some odd verse, 31 verses. 1 Corinthians 12. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that, in, <clears throat> that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit of God. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a, a message of wisdom, to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one has many parts, 
but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many parts. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, for not, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts in one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now... You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles and second prophets and third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and all different kinds of tongues. And all are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret tongues? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. May God bless the reading of his word. So this is a letter to the Corinthian church. In the Corinthian church, this particular passage is dealing with spiritual and giftedness. One, right, one body, many parts. It's not too complicated for us to grab hold of. We might even assume that the church in Corinth had been a very spiritual church and a very charismatic church because they're engaged in this conversation of spiritual and giftedness. But the reality of the situation is that the Corinthian church had a lot of problems, had a lot of difficulties, and that bunch, that congregation, had a lot of troubles. They were a problematic bunch. The church was filled with divisions, filled with arguments, filled with immorality, and filled with lawsuits against each other. And on top of that, there was a lot of confusion about marriage, about food sacrifice to idols, about worship, about the Lord's Supper, about resurrection, about the giving, about spiritual gifts. And in particular, some people even thought they were more important than others because their gifts could be seen in very spectacular ways, like preaching and teaching or giving out in the open so everyone could see, or praying so everyone could see. These Christians in Corinth were surrounded by corruption, and corruption was making its way into the congregation and into the fellowship. They struggled in their environment. They felt the pressure to adapt. They felt the pressure to conform, to do what everybody else was doing all around them, and to believe what they were believing. Does that sound any bit familiar? Maybe just a little bit to today's? congregations and churches they had tough questions like what to think about sexuality about idols 
about worship, cults, women's rights, government rule. Similar and redundant questions. The same social dilemmas. The same struggle in politics. You know why it all sounds so familiar? We're talking about people. That's what we're talking about. People. People are the same. Not much has changed. People are pretty much the same. Nothing new under the sun. My cell phone's new. I got a new car. People? Pretty much the same. See, no matter where you go, people. Now listen to the phrase. No matter when you go, people. You're reading something from 2,000 years ago. How applicable today. Why? The government's not the same. People are. Mode of transportation's entirely different. People aren't. Oh, the way in which we communicate is entirely different than it was back then. You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're communicating with people. It's the same. There's nothing new under the sun, God would say. When Paul wrote this letter to the church, he was specifically addressing many of these issues. And the Bible addresses these issues ever since there's been mankind. The topics that you find controversial and somewhat divisive or, or hot topic for the day have already been dealt with in the Word of God. have been dealing with people for as long as there's been people. And the answers mm, are usually found hmm, somewhere along the lines of sin, faith in Christ. It's not much more complicated than that. Until we start to redefine what sin is or morality. And then we see what happens to society. We see what happens when we redefine marriage, redefine gender, redefine moral truth. What's good to what's bad. And what's bad is now called good. The Bible said that Thousands of years ago, you're seeing it. God's seeing nothing new. Strange how humans pursue the very things that destroy them. Did you know that in prison, Bibles are passed out and Bible studies are encouraged? In public schools, not so much. Maybe if we handed out more Bibles in school, we'd have less need of them in prison. Paul is straightforward, and he confronts, really, each and every one of us, our own sinfulness, and he calls each of us not to blend into the world and accept its values and its lifestyles. We must live Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-led, loving lives that make a difference in the world for his glory. We read an entire chapter, an entire chapter. Many of you might be more familiar with the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. That's your benediction today, by the way. They call it the love chapter, right? Describes all these wonderful gifts, right? All the ways in which this Holy Spirit works within the body, and each one is different than another, but we all need each other. And then let me show you the most excellent way. And defines love. We think it's about the spiritual gift. You've missed it. It's evident and it's real and the spirit of God is strong. But it's love. For people. Not for things. For people. Let me give you an example of how kind of how the spiritual gifts work within the congregation and within the church, right? Potluck dinner last week. Thank you very much, by the way. Right, was that last week? Potluck dinner last week. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Appreciate your appreciation and all that goes on with that, and it was a wonderful time. Here's what happens. An illustration of spiritual gifts. Sam 
working through the buffet line. <clears throat> he drops a dessert cake off his, off his plate and hits the floor. Tim. Tim's wonderful gift of prophecy. I saw that coming. <laughs> right? Dave. Dave. Humbleness of heart. Servant attitude. I'll go grab a mop and clean it up. Gift of service. And there's Spencer. You know Spencer, our wonderful Sunday school teacher. Gift of teaching. There's Spencer. Spencer, well, the reason that it fell is because it was too heavy on one side. And the plates are not built to be able to unilaterally handle more weight on one side than another. Thank you, teacher. And Pam, with a beautiful gift of exhortation and encouragement, you know, maybe next time, Sam, allow someone else to carry the plate for you. It's amazing. And Jess, Jess with a great giving, right? Generosity. Sam, take my dessert cake. Just gives it over. Wow. Suzanne, wonderful gift of mercy. Gift of mercy. Just looks at Sam, don't feel too bad, Sam. It could have happened to anyone. The gifts displayed within the body. And then there's Melinda, a wonderful gift of administration. Dave, the mop's in the kitchen. Sue, grab the garbage can by the door. Wendy, get the paper towels for the door. Don't forget to turn the closet light off. And the whole time, the pastor just standing in the corner in amazement of the display of the spiritual gifts and in complete wonderment, where did he get the dessert? We've all been gifted differently. We all act differently. We all serve differently. Ready? The scriptures are pretty clear. Ready? For the common good. For the common good of God's people. That's amazing. This church has every gift that is needed in order to function as a biblical community. We lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not be in want. Can we stand there and walk in that? Or is your life miserable because of all the things you don't have? Or is it wonderful because of all the things that you do? Here's your next slide. We have all, we have all that is required to fulfill what God is asking of us to do today. Give us this day our daily bread. See, don't ask the Lord to bless your tomorrow if you're not willing to do what he's asking of you to do today. It's this moment. It's precisely at that moment when the cake drops off the plate. It's that moment when you remember what Christ has done for you. Yesterday's history. Can't do much about that. Tomorrow's just your imagination. All you got, right here and right now. And God says, I am. I am. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But he's in the I am. He's now. A church in Corinth, ready? Even with all its problems... Even with all its pressures, even with all its governmental entanglements and all the lawsuits and all the stuff that was going on, they did not lack any spiritual gift. God was there in the midst of all of that, as he is in the midst of all of your chaos and all of your struggle and all of your hurt. See, many choose not to act upon their gift, or maybe they find it inadequate because, well, they're not a preacher and they're not a teacher. 
Maybe it's not. Maybe it's less spectacular. Perhaps you're just too prideful or you're too influenced by your own flesh. You're still trying to figure out if you really believe or not. Whatever struggles were happening with the people, the Holy Spirit of God was present. God was still there. Even in the midst of all your doubt, all your confusion, and all your questions, God was present. And the gifts, the gifts were evident. That's daily walking with God and the Holy Spirit of God. So here's one of the things we probably need to work on is to identify your gifts. Here's your next slide. Identify your gifts. Do you remember where you came from? Now about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. So he starts to tell us about it. You know that when you were pagans, that means when you were an unbeliever, no way, somehow or other, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Remember how you were before there was a Christ in your life? Remember how you were before there was faith? Remember how you were before there was a cleansing and a washing away of your sins? Remember how you were? Once you followed gods that were dead. You followed gods that were unable to really speak or deaf to your prayers. Now, now you serve a living God, a resurrected God. Now you serve a risen God, a conquering God, an omniscient God, a warrior God, a loving God, a God beyond time, a creative God, an inspiring God. A God who loves you, even in the midst of all your questions, concerns, doubts, and uncertainty. Even in the midst of all the chaos of the world, the presence of God is here, and the presence of God is real, and the presence of God will dwell within you. Remember what you were? Now you're different. Now you can make some discernment about yourself. Now you can even look at yourself. Look around you. What's going on around you? Who's around you? What's going on in the world? What's going on in the world of the believers? What's going on in the world of the unbelievers? Many times we have to praise God and give thanks for all the stuff I came out of. I know all that stuff that I left behind. Are you leaving things back there? Or are you still carrying all that luggage with you? Are you forgiven almost? Or are you forgiven? Are you filled with 90% of the Spirit of God? Or are you filled with the Spirit of God? Remember once you did not know the truth, you were not filled with the Holy Spirit of God led astray, vulnerable, naive. Some of your ways were even euphoric experiences, drugs and sexual pleasures, and now I'm just talking about myself, sex, drugs, and disco, baby, you know? On a road to nowhere. On a road to nowhere. Living self-centered, selfish life. And listen, false experiences, they're not new to people. False pleasures, they're not new on the scene. Deceitful pleasures that are really just temporary. Temporary. They're temporary both physically and spiritually. I know I've been influenced by some bad spirits in my past, trying to manipulate my thoughts, trying to sway my behavior, trying to send me into the grave, destroy my marriage, take away a church, crush it, divide a church. There is an ongoing spiritual battle for my very own testimony. There is an ongoing spiritual battle for the testimony of this congregation and this church. And you, there is an ongoing spiritual battle over your soul. It's ongoing. And even in the midst of the battle, 
Even in the midst of confusion and uncertainty, God is present. God is present. The Spirit of God is with you. You are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit of God that allows you to be a conqueror in any circumstance, in any situation, no matter where and no matter when it is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen, bad fruit cannot be produced by a good vine. Bad fruit cannot be produced by a good vine. So, what are you grafted into? What kind of fruit is there in your life? Bad fruit is not produced by the true vine. The scriptures are clear there, too, and John, he will cut you off. He will prune you, and you will be cast. Why is that? How is that? Uh Uh-oh. Who has to sing? Somebody has to sing. Mark, you got to answer it now. You got to answer it. Answer it. Now now we're going to sing. Jesus loved me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but... He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. You didn't even answer it, man. You didn't answer. All that and you didn't answer. Uh, All right. Here's your next one. Get hold of why God took hold of you. Get hold of why God took hold of you. Do you know why? Tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why. If you're hesitant, then you don't really know why. Do you think it was just about your salvation? I can promise you it's not just about your salvation. If it was just about your salvation, you'd be gone already. (laughs) Be saved and taken away. There's some other reason why you're still hanging around. There was still some other reason why why Paul's in prison writing letters. Beep. Get hold. Get hold of why God took hold of you, right? And then he empowered you with giftedness. So we believe that, don't we? I mean, the Holy Spirit of God infills us, and we are prone and passionate towards an giftedness. Do we believe that? Amen. Do you know what your giftedness is? Here, let me give you a place where you can go look it up and maybe take some tests. There's your next slide. Do a spiritual gift assessment. Do more than one. Do three or four. And then you go, oh, look at that. I didn't realize I had the gift of hospitality. I guess I better invite some people over to my house. (laughs) Right? I know I have the gift of hospitality. I'm not a very good host. But everybody's welcome. (laughs) The gift of hospitality, right? Everybody's welcome in the church. It's a great gift of hospitality. I don't know what kind of host I'm going to be, but, right? Gift of hospitality. Grace, mercy, right? Administration. It, it, it'll shine. It'll, it, it'll shine. And why are you ungifted? For the common good. This is why God has empowered you beyond your own salvation. He's ungifted you with abilities, talents, gifts, right? To be able to serve one another. Watch this. Listen now. 80% of what you can do, <clears throat> most people can do. It's just ordinary stuff. Most, people can, most everybody can do just pretty much what you do. <laughs> Watch TV, <laughs> surf the internet, and drive a car, all right? Buy some clothes. 80%. That's, just, that's like the vast majority of people just to have everything in common like that. You could do what you can do. Another 15% on top of that 80% could do what you do in your work or your hobby with a little bit of training. They could do what you do. Just train them to do it, and they'll be able to do it, whether that's a hobby or playing the guitar or whatever that scenario might be, whatever your work is. But then there's this other leftover, like, small percent maybe 5%, we'll say, that's uniquely you, that only you can do, that no one else can do, that only 
is about you that makes you very unique than, say, everybody else who can surf the internet and watch TV and play a guitar or whatever. There's something unique about you. As unique as a fingerprint. Do you have a spiritual fingerprint? Like only you could be that person's, you know, parent, that mom or dad. See, like only you could exercise. I can't pay somebody to exercise for me. And right, only you can do the unique things that's uniquely for you. Only you can do that. And so what good is it if you discover what your gift is and never use it? What good is it to have the gift of teaching but never teach? What good is it to have the gift of hospitality but never invite anybody over to your house? What is it to have the gift of giving and never give? I have the gift of generosity, but I'm not giving anything away right now. See, the next part of that, the next part of that is to involve your gift. That's your next one. Involve your gift. You have to identify it, identify how God is working within you, that unique part of who you are, not what everybody else is doing and whatever their hobbies and they can do with the training and this, you, what's unique about you and those that are around you and your family and your friends and your church and your coworkers and you, there's something very special and very unique about you and God has seen to it and then it's involve your gift. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. See, it's the same God that's at work in the generosity, that's at work in the, in the mercy, that's at work in the administration, that's at work. It's the same God that's at work in the preaching. It's the same God that's at work in the teaching. It's the same God. It's the same Holy Spirit of God. And how often do we stand in judgment? Be careful who you're judging and why. Involve your gifts. The reason for the different offices is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, and to the building up of the body of Christ. There are a variety of effects reaching and influencing different kinds of people, reaching the lost and edifying the saints. That's really all we do. We reach for the lost and we edify the saint. God has designed diversity in the church. God has designed diversity within the church on purpose. He did this on purpose. Many different gifts require many different personalities. Celebrate it. We shouldn't ignore it. And listen, I get it. Some are going to clash. Some are going to clash, absolutely. There's no way you can be saved and listen to classical music. No, no, no. There's no way you can be saved and listen to rock and roll. No, you got that backwards. Whoa. Come on. What? Listen, some are going to swing golf clubs. Some are going to roll bowling balls. It's different. Some like sushi, some don't. Some like tacos, some don't. I, right? How boring it would be if every Christian was just like you. There is only one of you. Okay, we don't need another one. You see? And we don't need you to be anybody else. We don't need you to be anybody else. We need you to be who God is asking of you to be. Every Christian has been gifted with the Holy Spirit to work out God's plan. You're part of that plan. He calls certain individuals to certain places within the congregation. Ready? And here you go to the next slide. I kind of alluded to this a little bit already. Not only what you are, when you are. It's not just what, it's when also. He has you here for a time such as this. 
amongst these people, which are not different than people from 2,000 years ago. Because people have been people for as long as there's been people. And God is in gifting you and trusting you and empowering you for such a time as this. You're fully aware and fully engaged, fully informed. God has you here and now. Why? You get the joy of discovering. Seek me first and all these other things will be added unto you. Seek me first. The answers that you long for, I have. The peace that you long for, I have. I know the struggles. I'll bring you comfort. I know the tragedies and the controversies and the confusion. I know it all. I have something very special and very unique for you. That's a God that I want to honor and want to serve. And watch. If the people of God who are called together, right, in an assembly will work within the framework that God has designed for them. Do you know that church is God's idea, right? The assembling and coming together of a fellowship of believers is God's idea. So you can either follow, go along with God's idea or not. But it's God's idea. If the people who are called together in an assembly will work within the framework of what, how God has designed it, then he will not only work in you and through you, watch, he'll be working on others, producing an effect in their lives, that you will be ministering to. Do you understand? He's at work in you and through you. And he knows where he's going to bring you. He's working on these people to get you in the right place at the right time to hear the right message that you might be saved, that you might be healed, that you might be forgiven, that you might walk in grace and comfort and strength, that you might walk differently than the rest of the world. I want that God. I want to serve that God. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God of Scripture. And listen, oftentimes, oftentimes, he works in you and through you, and you're completely unaware. You are completely unaware. You're too busy in your own flesh, in your own mind, in your own confusion, in your own doubt, in your own, uh, and God is still present and at work. It's amazing the things that he does inside of you and in spite of you. God does his work. Let's yield to him. Watch. To fail in this, we end up working in the flesh. And then we're no better off than all the things that were being told to the Corinthian church. They were an organized bunch of people that just hated each other, didn't work well together. The unity of the Spirit of God wasn't there, and Paul had to address it, call it out. I'm addressing it and calling it out now. The Holy Spirit of God is here. He dwells within you. We have everything we need. You lack nothing. God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wants them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and one body. And then I have a strange question for you. Here's your next slide. Improve your gifts. Wrapping it up. Improve your gifts. How did you get so good at administration, Melinda? We can see that it's your giftedness. How did you get so good at it? I did it. What do you mean? Yeah, I learned and I did it. Oh, and you got better at it? Yeah. How did you learn to play the piano? Uh, I just, I did it. And I kept going at it and practicing and doing it. How did you get so good at granting mercy and forgiveness? I just did it. I just do it. I practice it. How did you get so good at teaching, Spencer? I just, I did it. I just do it. And just keep practicing and keep doing it and doing it and doing it and over and over and over and over and over again. Pastor, when are you going to get good at preaching? Why did, you, why did you make me write that, Lord? I'm going to keep practicing. 
and keep doing it and preaching it over and over and over again as long as you'll allow me. <laughs> so here was the question that was kind of, is it possible to improve your giftedness? Well, absolutely, right? Certainly we've seen that. Certainly we've seen that. At the very least, there's methodology that you can improve upon, right? There's methodologies in which you can improve. You recognize that there are times, right, when you need to speak and times when you need to not speak. There are times when it's time to teach and when it's time to not teach. And you need good discernment by the Holy Spirit of God to be able to recognize how to use and when to use your giftedness. Right? Is it possible to deepen your relationship with God? Yes. Wouldn't one of the methods be, right, to raise awareness and the usefulness of your own and giftedness, the very Spirit of God Himself at work within you? Utilization of the gift will strengthen your understanding of that gift. You just do it, do it, do it, and keep doing it. Listen, before you can be good at something, you're going to have to be bad. Before you can be good at something, you're going to have to be bad. And before you can be bad, you're going to have to try. It took me a long time to learn to play the guitar. I had to be bad at first. I had the, had the willingness to be bad, right? On the golf course, I had a couple pars. Woohoo! Yay for me. But I had to be willing to go through lots of rounds of golf without ever hitting a par. To get to a place, right? The fulfillment of the utilization of your gift requires that you have a right relationship with God. Ask him into your heart to work out that which he took hold of you for. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here together. Father, as a fellowship, a body of believers, Father, I pray that you might continue to work within us, shape us, mold us, guide us. Father, we're going to stand in the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. We're going to walk as forgiven. We're going to walk as empowered. We're going to walk as heirs to the throne of God. And we're going to walk you know, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And Father, I would pray that you might reveal to us how and why you took hold of us. And we might be influential, purposeful, in bringing you honor and glory and spreading the gospel come before you in the name of your son. Amen. One call has the power to change our life forever. It can transform us from the inside out and lead us into a new future. Whether or not we answer the call is up to us. God calls each of us to something greater than ourselves. We're called to impact our world with the message and love of Jesus Christ. Equipping us all with gifts and talents, God gives us the tools necessary to accomplish his will. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Hearing God's voice can be challenging. It doesn't always come as a loud ring, but it can come as a whisper. Even when we don't feel God is speaking to us, he's there. Be the change you wish to see in the world. This statement is true, but an even greater truth is, be the change that God calls you to be in the world. Will you answer the call? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Usually we have, and we do, usually we have some deacons at the back of the church are collecting for benevolence, offering for the congregation and for the church. We love to help when we can. Here's the love chapter for you. Anybody had this read at their wedding? Anybody at all? A couple people maybe had this read at their wedding? Maybe you might have a better understanding, understanding chapter 12 that we just went through. And then hearing this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, 
but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, and love is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. And love never fails. Go, serve your God. God bless you.